Professor Hayashi mentioned, uh, please feel free to uh, type a question in chat uh, if you like. I will keep an eye on the chat window and I'm happy to pause and uh, explain any concepts as we go along. So uh, my name is uh, Josh Bongard, and I'm a professor of computer science uh, here at the University of Vermont uh, in the northeastern United States. Uh, it's the evening here, so uh, good evening from Vermont and, and good morning to you all uh, in Japan. Um, we're going to be together for uh, this lecture and then a second lecture tomorrow on uh, machine science where in the first lecture today, we're gonna to look at using artificial intelligence technologies to automatically design uh, machines. And in the second talk tomorrow, we'll look at this idea of machine science, where we use AI or artificial intelligence to try and automate aspects of science uh, in general. So, um, what I'm going to do today in our discussion about evolutionary robotics is introduce you to what evolutionary robotics is, and Professor Hayashi asked me to uh, relate this back to the particular branch of robotics that many of you are interested in, which is uh, industrial uh, robotics and object manipulation. So there'll be a few slides in a few minutes about that uh, topic. Before we talk about robotics and evolutionary robotics in general, I'd like to take a step back and talk about the, uh, the entire landscape of AI and robotics at the moment, and then talk about where evolutionary robotics fits into that uh, landscape. So in order to introduce this overall AI landscape, I'm going to introduce a geometric metaphor. We're gonna use a geometry here to think about AI and robotics. I want you to imagine we have a single uh, axis here, which is labeled performance. And I want you to assume that in this one dimension, um, any point lying along this dimension represents um, a product of AI. It could be a neural network, it could be a robot, it's uh, something that's been produced by AI. And the further that point is placed on this line, the better that machine or neural network does at whatever it is that we want it to do. Um, for uh, ever since the Second World War, all the way up until the very early 2000s, as many of you know, um, we didn't make much progress in AI and most of the neural networks and robots that we made um, hovered somewhere to the left here. They weren't very good at doing whatever we wanted them to do. Um, but in the very early 2000s, thanks to the deep learning revolution and the big data revolution, um, we're now able to train neural networks or train robots that do uh, as well, if not better than humans at certain tasks. So if a point on this line represents the product of AI, you can think of an AI algorithm as a line segment embedded in this dimension. And obviously the longer this line segment is and the further to the right, the right hand edge of this line segment is, the better that AI method does at training neural networks or robots that do as well or better than, than humans. So this single dimension for our purposes is going to represent algorithms and the things that algorithms produce. We can then add a second dimension um, to this uh, picture, which is um, you can think the vertical axis as the number of tasks that the neural network or the robot can perform or generality. Um, and obviously we're very good, we're very good now at creating uh, AI or neural networks that are specialists. They're good at one thing. Um, for example, checkers and chess, and now the game of Go. Um, we're making more progress on computer vision. We're still so-so at creating machines that understand or produce natural language. So we can stack these tasks one on top of one another, where the task that's uh, higher in the vertical plane is more challenging. And what you get is something that looks like a diagonal going from the top left to the bottom right. Uh, for simple tasks, we can make machines that do as well, if not better than humans at chess uh, and go, but not as good as, uh, not as good as humans at natural language processing 
uh, and so on. Now you can think about algorithms in this plane as pushing from the bottom left to the uh, upper right and points along this diagonal line, this AI method, those points are becoming uh, better at whatever we want them to do. Those points are moving further to the right. And the points that are higher up are also more general. I've colored this line red, indicating that we're not very good at this yet. We cannot yet train machines that get more and more accurate and more and more general purpose. There are many um, in the field of AI that think with, uh, that just believe that if we have more computational power and more training data, we will eventually be able to produce more and more accurate and more and more general machines until we eventually start to approach this idea of artificial general intelligence, something that's as good and as flexible as a human being. What's often mix, missed in uh, the literature in AI and even in robotics is this third dimension of embodiment. And this term embodiment, um, it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Uh, my PhD advisor, uh, Rolf Pfeiffer, uh, was a pioneer in this area of embodiment. I'm not going to formally define embodiment today. I want you to just imagine that uh, machines like a neural network that has no body, it runs inside of a computer, that neural network has no ability to push against the world and watch or observe how the world pushes back. That's for our purposes what we're going to think of as a body. The body is a tool to extract information from the world actively rather than passively receiving information from the world through a computer like a neural network uh, tends to do. We can imagine, uh, we can imagine uh, machines that are more or less embodied. So here's the simple Roomba robot vacuum cleaner down here. It's embodied, but it has relatively few sensors and motors. And we have the Atlas humanoid robot at the back part of this cube with uh, more sensors, more, more motors, more morphological or embodied complexity. So we can now imagine any point in this cube where uh, machines that are closer towards the front of the cube are have little or no embodiment and points towards the back of the cube have more and more embodiment. Now we can imagine AI methods that represent this grand diagonal moving from the front left bottom corner of this cube towards the right top back corner of this cube and every point along this AI algorithm represents a machine that is getting better and better at a growing number of tasks and those machines along the way are are inheriting more and more embodiment they're becoming more uh, in, interesting and more embodied in the work in evolutionary robotics, we try and create algorithms that represent this green line where the evolutionary algorithm can modify both the brain and the body of the robot. So just to give you an example um, from some recent work about what this looks like, um, here's an example from Google from three years ago now. Um, this, this is uh, Google's famous what they call arm farm. So we have a bunch of arms here and they're all reaching into the dish in front of them and trying to manipulate objects uh, in that dish. Uh, and in this case, uh, in this case, they trained, they used all seven arms and over a four month period, these seven robot ar arms performed 580,000 grasp uh, attempts. Um, which uh, produced enough data from uh, the camera on these robot arms to train a 1.2 million parameter neural network. So that at the end of the four months, those arms uh, could, could grasp new objects with a 96% uh, success rate. It's a, it's a, a great achievement but again, these are specialized machines. Imagine we were to take this 1.2 million parameter uh, neural network and take it out of these uh, KUKA arms and put it into a new robot arm 
that had one additional motor, one additional degree of freedom, this network would completely fail and we'd have to start all over again. So in this case, you can think of this particular experiment or the, the, artificial, the AI training method that worked with the data from the ARM farm as being represented by this green arrow. Um, this green arrow is part way towards the back of the cube. So there is some embodiment here. Um, it's not that complicated a machine, but pretty complicated. Um, it's not that high in the cube. Object manipulation is uh, a relatively easy task, considering some of the other tasks we've tried to apply uh, robots to. And this point moves then, uh, the, uh, the neural networks move from left to right along this line. They get better and better at uh, enabling the robot arm to grasp objects. So going back to this picture here, what we would like to do in the future is something like an arm farm where we'd have that farm growing larger and larger. There'd be more and more machines and not all of those arms would be identical to one another. They would have differing and uh, greater embodiment or greater morphological complexity as new robot arms are being designed and deployed. So how do we move along this grand diagonal? That's, uh, as I mentioned, this is something that we try and tackle in evolutionary uh, robotics. And as the name implies, evolutionary robotics uses at the base level this idea of biological evolution. Um, you've all been taught this in high school. Uh, we start with a population of organisms. They have some genetic variation, which produces differences in their bodies and brains. Based on those body and brain differences, some of them are not able to survive long enough in their environment to produce offspring, so they die out. And those that do survive, obviously, uh, those that survive produce offspring that are similar but not identical to one another. Uh, there's a question about um, AGI on the previous slide, so that is artificial general intelligence. So there is a debate in the AI community about what is the best path to get to artificial general intelligence. Do we start with simple non embodied machines and drive towards increasingly more embodied more general purpose and more accurate machines or perhaps. We will get to AGI simply without worrying about embodiment at all. Perhaps we will eventually be able to train a non-embodied neural network to do all of these tasks plus others and act or uh, act as intelligently and as flexible as a, as a human being. Okay, uh, thanks for the question. Just a reminder, please don't be shy to type questions into chat. I'm happy to answer them uh, as we go. Okay, in my group and in the field of evolutionary robotics, we feel that the best way to approach artificial general intelligence to create useful and flexible machines is to des automatically design and train machines that become increasingly uh, complex, more general purpose and more accurate. And what I'm going to show you now is how we try to do this in evolutionary robotics. So I just mentioned in evolutionary robotics, our inspiration is Darwinian uh, evolution. And going all the way back to the 1970s, um, uh, researchers started to write down what became known as genetic algorithms, which is a computer algorithm, um, not unlike biological evolution. Here, instead of organisms, we have uh, strings of numbers, where each string of numbers uh, you can think of as DNA, and it encodes a candidate solution to a given problem. Here, I haven't specified what the problem is, and we'll, we'll worry about that a little bit later. We create a population. At the beginning, we create a population of random candidate solutions. In this case, they're vectors of uh, real values, as you can see. We take each of those uh, random vectors, and we uh, the computer scores how good that uh, solution is at solving the given problem. The computer deletes those solutions that get a low score and makes randomly modified copies of the surviving solutions. 
In this little cartoon example here, you can say, see that this particular solution, uh, we've taken part of the numbers from this solution or this parent. We've taken part of the We've taken part of the solutions from the second parent solution and we've combined them into a new child solution. And we've also introduced some errors when we were copying numbers from the parents. This 0.4 has become 0.5. Those errors are representing mutation. The combining of uh, sub vectors from surviving vectors or surviving solutions into a new vector or a new solution, that's sexual reproduction. If we repeat this process over and over again, we eventually obtain a population of solutions that are all relatively good at solving whatever problem uh, we wanted to solve in the first place. That's the, uh, the genetic algorithm. In evolutionary robotics, what we do is the, solu the, um, the solution is not a vector of numbers anymore. It's a robot. And the problem is whatever we want the robot to do. So in evolutionary robotics, instead of a population of vectors, we have a population of robots. The computer assigns a score to each of the robots. The computer deletes the low scoring robots and makes randomly modified copies of the surviving robots. Um, this is an idea that's been around since the early 1990s. Um, this is one of the very first evolutionary robotics experiments. What you're watching here is a collection of uh, some of these evolved robots, which were all obviously evolved uh, in simulation. Um, this was a pretty impressive experiment uh, at the time. Uh, you can see that these are simulated robots um, operating inside a physical simulator or a physics engine. Um, you, physics engines exist in all modern video games, but in 1994, uh, Carl Sims, the researcher here, he actually wrote his own physics engine. He wrote or created his own virtual world and then attached this evolutionary uh, robotics algorithm to this virtual world. And as you can see here, the evolutionary algorithm is not just training the brain for a fixed robot. The evolutionary algorithm is modifying both the brain and the body of the simulated robot simultaneously. Um, we, could, we could discuss whether or not these actually qualify uh, as robots. They're virtual creatures existing in a virtual world. So six years after this experiment was performed, uh, Hod Lipson and Jordan Pollock at Brandeis University, just outside Boston, Massachusetts, uh, published this groundbreaking paper uh, in uh, uh, Nature magazine, which demonstrate was one of the very first academic uses of a 3D printer. What I'm going to show you here, and I'll put this on loop so we can watch this for a while. What you'll notice here um, are three evolved solutions. Three evolved solutions up here. These are taken from this population of evolving simulated robots. And uh, they sent those evolved blueprints to a 3D printer that printed just thermoplastic. Um, so they printed the skeleton. They printed these hollow cylinders. And then Lipson and Pollock, Pollock manually put uh, motors and sensors and electronics and batteries. Uh, actually, not batteries. You can see there's an off board power source here. And it turns out that for some of these evolved solutions from simulation, they were able to uh, cross the reality gap. I'm gonna just type this into chat here. This is an important concept in evolutionary robotics, which is um, there's no guarantee that the robots that evolve in simulation will transfer successfully to uh, reality. Here are three examples that did transfer successfully. As you can imagine, there were dozens and dozens of other evolved solutions that did not transfer to uh, reality. Okay, I'm just gonna pause there for a moment. If there's any questions, again, please feel free uh, to type uh, them into chat. Otherwise, I'll, I'll continue on. Okay. 
Okay, um, so again, Professor Hayashi asked me to uh, relate this back to uh, industrial robots and robot arms and object manipulation. So we're now going to jump from 2000 uh, to 2010. And in 2010, uh, again, Hod Lipson and some of his colleagues uh, published a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science about uh, what they came to call a, a universal uh, jamming gripper. This is not an evolutionary robotics experiment. This, this is a, a robot design that was designed by a, a roboticist. And I'll show you this uh, gripper in action. Some of you may have uh, may know about uh, jamming grippers already. As most of you know, with a traditional robot hand and fingers, um, some objects are easier to grasp uh, than others. Uh, this is the universal jamming gripper. Um, that blue ball that you see is uh, basically a balloon and inside are coffee grounds. So coffee beans that have been ground up. And in the current example here, they have evacuated or removed all the air from the balloon. And that causes the small grains to lock together and jam and maintain a 3D shape. When they allow air to return into the gripper, it, the gripper relaxes again. So what you're gonna watch here is a series of object uh, manipulations and grasps uh, and dropping that into the, the cup. Okay, I'm just gonna pause here. Uh, there's another question here. Did 3D printers already exist in 2000? Uh, they definitely already existed at that time, but as you can imagine, they were extremely expensive. Um, they were they only existed uh, at some very large companies. Um, there were very, very few of them at universities. Um, and there was uh, one of them at Brandeis University where uh, Lipson and Pollock were working. So 3D printers existed, but th that was one of the very first uses of them uh, at a university. Okay, so uh, let me just return to the universal jamming gripper here. And I'll show you again, we can watch some more of these grasps again. So what you're watching is when it grabs the object, they pull, remove the air or pull a vacuum and the coffee grounds jam around the object. And then when they wanna release it, they allow air back into the, the balloon. I'll just uh, let you watch some of the, the grasps here for those who haven't seen this before. So the jamming gripper is a great example of this idea of embodiment, um, which I mentioned already means a lot of different things to different people. One of the ideas behind embodiment is if you get the right body, you get the right design, it makes behavior easier. And I think the jamming gripper is the best uh, example uh, of this. There's only one mechanical degree of freedom, which is uh, re uh, releasing or adding air back into the, the gripper. Just pause there for a moment. Um, we can then ask, uh, we can, this is sort of a starting point. So again, humans came up with this design. Um, uh, Joseph asks, what was the rationale for using coffee? Are there other suitable substitutes? That's a great question. So why coffee grounds? Um, the reason why is if you zoom in on coffee grounds, as you can see in this uh, in this uh, single coffee ground under a microscope, it has a very irregular shape. So if you imagine a very large number of irregular grains, if you put, remove air, they're going to pull together. And because of their complex structure, they're going to interlock with one another, which makes them very strong which at the level of the gripper as a whole, allows it to maintain its 3D structure, maintain the grasp around uh, an object. In evolutionary robotics, we always wanna try and optimize the physical design of our robot, as well as the neural control policy. In this case, the control of a, a gripper is, is kind of trivial. Uh, remove air when you're in contact with the object, and release, uh, add air back in when you want to release the object. Uh, 
But we can ask the following question, which is our coffee grounds, as Joseph mentioned here, you know, are they are they the best shape? Is, there, is this a good rationale? Might there be other shapes that are possible? In a paper from just this past year, uh, Howard and his colleagues applied evolutionary uh, robotics to soft robot jamming grippers. And they did so in the following way. They parameterized the shape of individual uh, grains into uh, two different parameters, the aspect ratio of the grain and the shape factor M. Doesn't really matter what these are for the moment. But if you look at each of these grains, you can think about the vector of two numbers, uh, length two vector associated with each grain. And you can think of that vector as the DNA. You can then ask the following question, what are the optimal values for M and alpha? that would maximize the ability to grasp and release uh, objects. So coffee works pretty well, but maybe there are some other things that work even better. So uh, this was some work they did in simulation. A lot of the work in evolutionary robotics is done in simulation. Not all of it is transferred from sim uh, to real. In this case, uh, they're demonstrating uh, a uh, soft jamming gripper that's made from just spheres or balls. You'll notice that they do a pretty good job of grasping, but they're not very good at holding on to the object. In panel B here, the object slips from out of the jamming gripper. This next, uh, in this next slide here, you're seeing uh, nine different evolved uh, nine different evolved grains. And I apologize, there's a third vector here, beta. I don't remember what beta uh, represents, but you can go and read the paper and have a look. Um, so in this case, uh, they looked at, um, they looked at uh, grasping objects that, had, uh, that were 14 millimeters wide, 10 millimeters wide, and seven millimeters wide. And in the case of the 14 millimeter wide object, this particular shaped grain uh, was optimal in the sp space of all of these parameterized grains. It's not necessarily the case that these grains are better than coffee grounds. This is just to demons demonstrate that in the space of jamming grippers, you can evolve this interesting aspect and improve the ability to uh, jam and unjam under a vacuum or uh, air, uh, regular air pressure. In the case of the narrower object, this particular shaped grain uh, was optimal. So this is kind of interesting, and I guess maybe in retrospect, kind of obvious, but for different objects, there are gonna be different shaped grains that are uh, better suited. Um, they looked at a seven millimeter wide object and found that was the same, uh, same optimal shape for the seven millimeter objects as for the 10 millimeter objects. Okay, so I just wanted to show that to you again, I know most of you here are interested in robot arms and ob uh, industrial robotics and object manipulation. It's interesting to think about um, all the different di physical dimensions of uh, um, uh, robot arms, fingers, grippers. This is obviously a very, very simple example that was just published last year. And I think that demonstrate that there is a lot of room for discovery and innovation in this space. Um, for example, in the, in the jamming gripper, it's usually a spherical. Uh, it's usually a spherical arrangement, but there's no reason why we need to use a spherical arrangement. You can imagine a soft, uh, a soft rubber glove, and you could fill that glove with coffee grains or some other. Uh, some other type of grains. You could fill the palm of the hand with one type of grain and you could fill the fingers with differently shaped grains. There's obviously a lot of room for creativity and optimization in this space. Might be an interesting uh, area for some of you to explore. Uh, one last uh, example from uh, the object manipulation space that I wanted to talk about. This is some work by Professor uh, Fumia Ida uh, at Cambridge University who published this paper back in 2015. And what he showed in that paper um, is you can actually use this idea of hot melt, uh, hot melt ad adhesives. 
which is, uh, as the name implies, you heat up an, an adhesive, basically a glue into a liquid form, and then the robot arm can extrude this liquid ad adhesive that melts, that, that is melted, and as it cools, it will solidify. And when it does, that solidified uh, adhesive becomes the hand for the robot gripper. So I'll show you this, and I apologize, the resolution is relatively low. Here, um, some uh, hot melt adhesive is being extruded to make a cup. And that uh, cup is going to cool and solidify. You can't quite see it here, but on the tip of this robot arm is a glue gun that extrudes the hot melt adhesive. Here it's building the bar. Uh, building a bar that it's going to attach to the cup in a moment. You can see it extruding some of the hot melt adhesive. It's now going to attach the bar. The robot hand is going to attach the bar to the cup. Uh, sorry, there's the bar. It's now attaching the bar to the cup. Here's the attachment occurring right here. The gripper has now the gripper has now picked up the cup and now the cup is the end effector for the robot and it's able to cup some liquid and move it from one cup uh, one basin into another. So this is an interesting experiment, which again is not evolutionary robotics, but there's some follow on work from Professor Ida's group where they evolved the shape of this uh, end effector. So the evolutionary algorithm was sending designs to the robot arm. The robot arm would print or make that evolved end effector, and then it would use that end effector for a new task. It's another sort of interesting intersection between evolutionary robotics and uh, object manipulation that I thought some of you might be interested in. Okay, um, so I'm going to come back now to some of uh, the work from my group where we focus increasingly these days on uh, the evolution um, of uh, evolution, not of robot arms or end effectors, but of soft robots. This is some work by uh, Nick Cheney and his colleagues. Um, and I, what you're watching now is a relatively new uh, physics engine. Uh, it's, I guess, six or seven years old now. Um, it's a finite element method where the finite elements are voxels or 3D voxels or volumetric or 3D pixels. What you're watching in this video is an evolutionary algorithm that is evolving a population of soft robots. And every cut in this video is showing you the best robot in the population at that time. You can see in this case, in this video, how the evolutionary algorithm is modifying, how the evolutionary algorithm is modifying these robots. It's modifying their three dimensional shape. And it's also modifying the distribution of material properties across the robot body. So I just showed you hot melt adhesives, jamming grippers. One of the interesting things that's happening in robotics is soft robotics, the ability to make robots from increasingly exotic and non-intuitive materials. It's hard to think about, uh, you might be able to think about a good design for a rigid, uh, for a rigid uh, robot arm with uh, rigid fingers, but if you start to think about hot melt adhesives and jamming grippers, it's a much um, less intuitive design space. And it might be much more advantageous to uh, use an evolutionary algorithm to explore the space of possible designs uh, for you. Um, in this experiment here, I'll just play this again, there were four different materials that the soft robot could be built from. There's red and green voxels, and these are active voxels. These are voxels that increase and decrease uh, their volume, um, and they increase and decrease their volume in antiphase. There is also uh, dark blue voxels, which are not used very much by this evolutionary algorithm, which are passive hard material. 
You can think of those as the bone of bones of the soft robot. And there are also light blue voxels, which represent passive uh, soft material, which is the equivalent uh, of fat in this case. And not surprisingly, if we try and evolve robots to move as quickly as possible, evolution basically builds a ball of muscle. It only really uses uh, red and green voxels. Again, in retrospect, maybe that's obvious, but one of the fun things about evolutionary algorithms is it often gives you surprising uh, solutions. Okay. I'm going to spend a couple minutes now just going into some of the technical details of how modern evolutionary algorithms uh, work. Uh, the one that we use in my lab is called Age Fitness Pareto Optimization, or AFPO. Um, it's an, it's, an AFPO is a significant advance over genetic algorithms. I'm going to explain how AFPO works. And then I'm going to show you why AFPO tends to work better than genetic algorithms, why AFPO tends to find better robots or better solutions than a GA does. In AFPO, we, we can visualize how AFPO works by creating two dimensions here. One is age and one is uh, error. We can then evaluate each, we can create a bunch of random robots to make up our population. In this case, we're gonna assume we have just four robots in the population, and we're gonna score the error of each of these uh, robots. So assume that we want it to grasp an object correctly, and there's an error in the grasp attempt, for example. So we want to design these robots to minimize uh, error. It's often easier in AFPO to think about minimizing error than it is at maximizing desired behavior. Okay, we're starting this algorithm. So we're assuming that each of the four robots in the population has an age of zero. And we're going to color the, uh, the robot that has the lowest error, the best one, green, and all the rest uh, red. We're going, to, uh, we're going to delete all the red ones, the ones that had higher error. And in this case, we have just a single surviving robot and we have three empty slots in the population. So uh, we're going to take that one survivor and it has survived into the next generation. So we increase that robot's age by one. Okay. We now uh, create a new random robot in the population from scratch, from, from just out of the blue. So this robot has an age of zero. We have two empty slots remaining. Um, in this case, our random robot produces an offspring and the survivor produces an offspring. You'll notice that the survivor and the offspring have the same age, which seems a little strange. Age here represents the age of a family. So in this case, this family has been around for one generation. This family, which was just created in this new generation, has one parent and one child. So the age of this family is zero. We are now going to look at this new population of four robots, and we're going to look for what are called uh, dominated solutions. And this is, uh, these are words that come from this, uh, this area of mathematics known as Pareto optimization. What is a dominated solution? A dominated solution is one that is dominated by another solution in the population. That there exists some other, some other solution other than this one that, has, that is better at both error and better at age. Sorry, there's a typo there, it should be error. So this particular solution is dominated by this solution. This solution is younger and better. Um, this solution is dominated by this one, which is the same age, but uh, the same age, but has lower uh, error. So we're going, we're going to visit each of these four solutions in turn, and we're going to color it red if it's dominated, if there is some other so solution that is better at it than, uh, be it's better or equal to it at the other two objectives. 
and we're going to leave uh, we're going to leave a robot green. Or we're going to color it green if it's non-dominated. So for this uh, this particular robot here, there is no other robot in the population that is below and to the left of it. As you can see, this gives us these two solutions here, two, uh, survive, two green solutions, two red solutions. The green ones always survive. The red ones are always uh, deleted. So we have two survivors. We age those two survivors. So we have one individual from two families. This family is two generations old. This family is only one generation old. And we repeat this process. In this case, now we again, we always create one random robot. So this is a new family. This family is age zero. In this case, just by by sheer luck, this particular random robot is better than these two surviving robots. So even before we create this fourth solution, we can look at these three. This older solution is dominated by this new lower error solution. And this older solution is also dominated by this lower error solution. Depending on the fourth point, this particular robot here or this, this individual is going to kill off or drive to extinction these two older families. Okay. We're now going to look at an evolutionary, a real evolutionary algorithm that was evolving, uh, that was evolving uh, robots. So in this case, we have evolutionary time on the horizontal axis. I just walked you through in this little cartoon, two generations. In this actual robotics experiment that ran for over 6,000 generations, we were evolving millions and millions of robots. The vertical axis here represents distance traveled in voxels, a di distance traveled. So basically the speed of the virtual robot and the virtual robots in this experiment look exactly like the ones I just showed you. These we're going to evolve these soft voxel based robots. Okay. Each, uh, each colored uh, pixel here represents one robot and colored lines represent families. So along these colored lines are a bunch, along this red line, for example, there are a bunch of red dots, which represent the best individual in that, in that red family at that time. Uh, Joseph asks a question, are the randomized generation of the better robots in the Pareto optimization introduced at the expense of others? I'd like to know if there's a trade-off. Um, exactly, that's a great point. Um, they're not, uh, they're introduced at the expense of others. So we, at this point, we have two empty slots in the population. In AFPO, whenever we repeat this process, if we have a population of N, um, some of them die off and we have less than N survivors and we have a certain number of empty slots. In AFPO, at every generation, we always inject one ran new random individual that represents a new family. So I think in response to your question, it's kind of at the expense of the older families because those older families can produce children to fill those remaining empty uh, slots. If we weren't introducing a new random robot every generation, there'd be one additional empty slot, which would give the ability for one of the families to produce one additional, uh, one additional offspring. Um, let me know if that answered your question, Joseph, by just typing yes or okay in chat. Otherwise, I'll, I'll try and answer it again. Yeah, thank you. I, I don't. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> Okay, so why add in this additional uh, objective of age? The reason why is uh, if you think about a typical population, um, if you have individuals in that population, the older ones, the older families have had longer to adapt to, or they've had longer to evolve. So they're generally speaking going to be better than any new genetic material, any new families that that are introduced in the population. 
Another way to think about this is if you think about biological evolution, if you think about an, uh, an island in the ocean, there are a certain number of species on that island and they have had thousands or millions of years to adapt to the weather conditions on the island. They've had a lot of time to adapt to each other. They've reached some sort of equilibrium. Imagine a tropical storm washes up a few individuals from some other island or from the mainland. Those individuals are new to the ecosystem on this island, and they are probably not very well adapted to that island, and they're going to be quickly driven to extinction or killed off by the species that have evolved on that island. However, if those new species that had washed up on that island had had long enough to evolve, they might be able not only to survive and thrive on that island, but they might, or their descendants might have certain characteristics that they brought from the mainland that allows them to do, that, that would allow them to survive even better on the island than those species that have been there for thousands or millions of years. So imagine whenever there's new genetic material, there's new random robots that are introduced into this population. Because they're young, they have a little bit of an advantage compared to the older individuals. So they don't, the new individual, the new families aren't selected against as strongly. They have a lower probability of being driven to extinction and they get an opportunity to evolve and in some cases push older species to extinction. This is what this picture represents. So let me describe this for you here. On the horizontal axis here, we have generations of evolving uh, robots. At this particular point, a new red ro random robot was introduced into the population, age zero. It was much worse than this green robot up here. But this robot produced children, which produced children, which produced children, and those red children, red grandchildren, red great grandchildren got more and more uh, fit. They moved faster and faster and faster until eventually one red robot appeared that moved faster than the green robot, even though the green family has been around for much, much longer than the red family has. So in turn, <laughs> While this was occurring, a new blue robot appeared in the population that was worse than these than the, the old red family, but the blue family gradually evolved and eventually displaced the red family. Another way to think about this is the dinosaurs, which ex existed for a very long period of time. The dinosaurs weren't driven to extinction by another species. They were obviously driven to extinction by an external event, but you get you get kind of the idea here. So one of the nice things about AFPO, and for those of you that are interested in evolutionary computation, I suggest you check it out and try coding up AFPO for yourself, is that you get evolution producing faster and faster robots over time. And if you look at this top curve, you can see that the fastest robot in the population at any given time had a different color. For hundreds of generations, the fastest robot was a green robot, a blue robot, then a yellow robot. The colors here, they represent different families. And those families have robots that have very different shapes and very different material distributions. So we get not just better and better robots, but we get a diversity of shapes and material properties. That's particularly important in robotics because in evolutionary robotics, we're often optimizing our robots in simulation and not all of those robots are gonna transfer successfully from simulation to reality. So if instead of evolving one robot and hoping that that robot uh, survives the simulation to reality gap, if we have a population of diverse solutions, even if 99% of them do not transfer from simulation to reality well, we still have 1% that do. And I'm gonna show you some examples of that uh, in a few minutes. Okay, I'll just pause here for a moment. Again, if there's any questions, please go ahead and, and type them into chat or unmute yourself and just ask your question if that's easier. Okay. 
Uh, Sylvain asks, AFPO sounds very close to particle filters to me. Did you experience the same issues like deprivation? I suppose adding a new random is a way to prevent this and use him to... I'm not actually familiar with particle filters. Um, it could be. There are many, many uh, evolutionary algorithms and other meta heuristics which try and balance exploration and exploitation. So improving solutions you already have or exploring new kinds of solutions. The thing that I like particularly well about AFPO is that it's parameterless. So you'll notice that I didn't have to decide how many individual, I didn't have to set a hyperparameter for how many survivors, how many offspring to produce, uh, and so on. It changes dynamically during the evolutionary process, depending on the Pareto front. So the Pareto front, the Pareto front in this cartoon example here, all the green solutions, the, solu the set of non-dominated solutions and the number of individuals in that Pareto front increases and decreases over evolutionary time. It's not something you have to determine beforehand. So I'm not sure about particle filters, but uh, of all the evolution, all the algorithms that try and balance exploitation and exploration, I like AFPO because it does it with relatively few hyperparameters. It's relatively easy to get AFPO to work because you don't need to tune these hyperparameters to balance exploration and exploitation. Thanks for the, the pointer to particle filters, though. Okay. Um, I'm now going to, again, not, I'm not going to talk now about the evolutionary algorithm. I'm going to switch to talking a little bit about what exactly the evolutionary algorithm is evolving. Um, up till now, I've just been saying that the evolutionary algorithm is evolving robots. Um, in this in this experiment and the other ones I'm going to show you uh, for the rest of this lecture, the evolutionary algorithm is actually encoding a generative network, and that generative network generates a robot. So the generative network is I, I showed you this cartoon example of genetic algorithms encoding populations of vectors. In, uh, in our usage of AFPO, the AFPO evolves populations of generative networks, and each generative network has a set of numbers or parameters that describe that network. Evolution tinkers or plays with those parameters, and by changing the parameters of the generative network, it changes the shape and material distribution of the robot that it generates. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about these generative networks for a few minutes. This is uh, a little bit technical, so if you don't get all the details here, that's fine as well. We use a particular kind of generative network known as a compositional pattern producing network, or CPPN. Um, these were invented by Ken Stanley back in 2007. Um, some of you may be more familiar with generative adversarial networks, or GANs, um, which are very successful. Uh, CPPNs came long before uh, GANs, and they all share this kind of property where uh, the network itself may be relatively simple and very small and described by a few parameters, but it can generate something that has many that has more complexity. Uh, in this case, we're going to look at relatively simple CPPNs that have few parameters, and they generate robots that are made up of hundreds or thousands, or uh, these days we can do tens of thousands of voxels. Okay, so um, here's a three neuron CPPN, X, Y, and G. How does a CPPN work? CPPN works by defining a space. Um, in this case, we're going to define a two-dimensional space. We are going to visit each coordinate in this space. We're going to start with 0, 0, or x equals 0, y equals 0. We're going to take those, two, those coordinates, and we're going to feed the coordinates into the input layer of the CPPN, and we're going to propagate the values from the input layer of the CPPN to the output layer of the CPPN, which in this case is just a single neuron. And we're going to treat the value that arrives at that output neuron as a uh, color. Uh, in this case, it's going to not actually color, it's just gray, the amount of gray that we put at this uh, point. We're then going to go to the next coordinate in the space, x equals 0 and, uh, sorry, x equals 0.1 and y equals 0. We're going to input 0.1 
and zero to the input layer of the same CPPN, propagate those values through the CPPN, get a new G or grayscale value back, assign that color or that grayscale to the, the pixel at that coordinate. And we're gonna continue, we're gonna visit a bunch of points in this two-dimensional space. And the CPPN in essence is going to paint color across this two-dimensional space or paint an amount of gray. In this cartoon example here, you can see that there's a synapse or a weight that connects X to G, but Y is not connected to G. So it doesn't matter what value Y has, it doesn't influence the amount of G. You can see in this example here that the greater the value of X, the greater the amount of G or the greater the amount of gray we paint onto that uh, pixel. Here's a second CPPN, it has the same architecture, two input neurons, one output neuron. We've changed the connectivity between the input layer and the output layer, which ends up painting a different uh, pattern onto this two-dimensional space. So here's the DNA, the generative network or the CPPN, and that this network is described by a set of uh, weights so those are the values in the DNA, the genes in the DNA, if you like. That DNA produces something. In this case, it produces just a, a, a pattern in two-dimensional space. We can do other things to CPPNs, like including different activation functions. So here's a step uh, function, which means that X has to be above some value in order for gray to be deposited. And if X is below that threshold, no gray is deposited. We can start to add more layers into our CPPN. So here's our input layer, here's our output layer, and here's a hidden layer that has different activation functions. And by adding new layers into our CPPN, we are allowing the CPPN to compose a series of coordinate transformations, which is where the compositional comes from. And those, uh, those composed coordinate transforms ends up producing more and more complex and you might argue prettier interesting uh, patterns. Finally, um, in panel G here, you can increase the dimensionality of what is generated. In this case, we are now going to paint a pattern in a three-dimensional space. We're going to visit a set of points in this space. We're going to take the 3D coordinates, X, Y, and Z, feed those coordinate values into the input layer to determine how much gray to place not on that pixel, but on that voxel. Remember that a voxel is a volumetric or 3D pixel. Some of you might, might have guessed by now where this is going. In 2014, uh, Chini et al, they took CPPNs, combined them with AFPO, and AFPO is now evolving populations of CPPNs. Each CPPN has an X, Y, and Z input neuron. And at the output layer, there are, actually, there are actually three output neurons, this one, this one, and this one. This one, the value at this output neuron is reduced to a binary value, zero or one. And that zero or one indicates whether to place or not place a voxel at that particular coordinate. So you can imagine visiting a bunch of points inside this empty cube and depending on the X, Y, Z coordinates, they're going to produce a zero or a, which means no voxel is placed at that coordinate or a different coordinate will produce a one at that output neuron, meaning place a voxel at that position. The second output neuron is reduced to a value, uh, an integer of zero, one, two, or three, which represents the four possible colors that can be placed on the voxels. So the first output neuron is gonna de determine where to place voxels. The second output neuron is gonna determine what color to paint on those voxels. And the third uh, output neuron uh, determines whether it's uh, uh, whether it expands or contracts. It's a detail that doesn't really matter for us today. 
Okay, so now we've gone from painting abstract patterns to painting or constructing 3D objects. We take that 3D object and we put it into the physics engine, the soft robot physics engine. I think I forgot to mention this. Bodied physics engine is called VoxCAD. And as you saw in the video, that causes, that brings this 3D structure to life. And in VoxCAD, we can measure how fast the robot moves. And that value, that velocity, is the fitness of the CPPN. CPPNs that produce slow moving robots are deleted. CPPNs that produce faster moving uh, robots have a better chance of surviving and producing offspring. Okay, so that's evolutionary soft robotics. Um, as I mentioned, um, we're using VoxCAD, this soft bodied simulator. Uh, again, to tie this back to some of the things that you all are interested in, uh, robot manipulation or object manipulation. Um, it would be interesting to try and evolve in a finite element, uh, uh, finite element uh, model, different kinds uh, of grippers. Here's an example of a compliant, uh, a compliant mechanism. Um, I think some people have actually tried this with uh, robot manipulation and object manipulation. Again, something that might be interesting to, uh, to look into. Okay, um, so I wanted to just uh, uh, mention a little bit about this simulator. Some of you might be interested in physical simulation. Um, VoxCAD was published by uh, Hiller and Lipson back in 2014. Um, it simulates uh, soft bodies as a collection of voxels. And these voxel, voxel, uh, neighboring voxels are attached to one another with Euler beams. So we can specify uh, the forces and torques that are acting on those beams. We can integrate those forces uh, and torques forward in time to get the accelerations, uh, the rotational and linear accelerations of the voxels themselves. And that we can use that to update uh, the positions and shapes of the voxels uh, themselves. Um, so again, just for those that are interested, uh, go check out VoxCAD. Okay, um, another thing I wanted to mention, which again might be interested, interesting to the roboticists here, is obviously when we're trying to design or train a robot to do something, there may be multiple uh, features of the behavior that we're interested in. I just showed you AFPO, which uh, optimizes two different objectives, age and error. Um, in that example, it was trying to uh, it was trying to minimize age and minimize error. Imagine we take two other objectives: displacement. So we want to evolve something that moves quickly, but we want it to uh, maximize efficiency. We want to use as little energy as possible as it moves. So here we now. Um, we now have dominated solutions down here in which there is another solution which is uh, faster moving and more efficient than this particular robot down here. So optimality is now up and to the right. In AFPO, we are trying to minimize age and minimize uh, error. So optimality was pushing down and to the left. Doesn't really matter which direction we're heading in. Uh, here's an example. Uh, this sort of shows you when you do this, uh, when you do evolutionary algorithms and you optimize against different features of the behavior. These are the kinds of things that you get. Here's an example of what my student called the hammer tailed uh, upsilon here. Uh, it moves very quickly. This is probably not something that you could transfer successfully from simulation uh, to reality. Uh, you'll notice that there are huge shape deformations as the robot is moving. So this is extremely inefficient, but extremely fast moving. Here's an example of a robot that is at the other end, uh, the other end of the Pareto front. This one is much more moving, but it is much more energy efficient and you'll see how this video starts playing. I apologize for the slow loading here.
In this particular experiment, the red voxels are active, so they're actively increasing and decreasing their volume. So you can imagine pushing air in and out of these vo red voxels. Remember that the light blue voxels are passive soft material. You'll notice that the majority of the body of this robot is passive. There's only a small amount of it that's actuated. The And so there's a complex interplay between the internal forces in this soft body that results in uh, this uh, quadrupedal gait, this four-legged way of walking. I like this particular evolved robot because it's a great example of this idea of embodiment. If you get the body right, in this case the right shape and the right material distribution of materials, you get a very nice solution. You're able to get locomotion with very uh, that's very energy efficient. This is a locomotion example. I, I bet you you could find a similar example in object manipulation. What's the right shape and distribution of material properties for a robot gripper that simplifies or increases the energy efficiency of the grasp itself? The grasp and the lift, if you like. Here's another example. Um, this was actually done in, uh, in a water simulation. So uh, here's just an example of some evolved soft-bodied swimmers for those that are interested in that kind of thing. Uh, so Professor Hayashi asks, uh, the longer the optimized time, the higher the level of anatomy and behavior. So that's a great example. Uh, it's a great question. So let me back up to here. So here's optimized time on the horizontal axis. We know that behavior is improving, which is the speed of the uh, robots. What's not clear from this picture is whether the robots down here were morphologically simpler than the robots up here. I'm not sure that that was the case in this experiment, but that's actually a great research question. As these robots get better, does evolution complexify the anatomy or the morphology, or does it simply modify it? We know obviously in biological evolution over the last 3.5 billion years, generally speaking, and uh, organismal body plans have become more complex. It's a, a great question that's, that's uh, investigated in evolutionary biology, which is known as the arrow of complexity. Under what conditions do things become more complex as they get better over evolutionary time? I don't think we have a good question for whether that happens in evolutionary algorithms and what are the conditions that are necessary and sufficient for that to happen? It's a good question, still, still an open question in the field. Okay. Uh, so just a, a little bit about soft uh, robots. I showed you the universal jamming gripper, which was a balloon filled with coffee grounds. Um, and you can pull a vacuum or, or add, air, add air back in. Uh, we borrowed that idea when we created physical soft uh, robots. Sylvain, I see your question. Let me just finish my thought about soft robots here. Um, this particular work on physical soft robots was carried out together with... Um, uh, the fabri uh, the, sorry, the fabratory, the fabratory at Yale University. Um, that lab is headed by uh, Rebecca Kramer Botiglio. So some of her students came up with this great way of building uh, silico hollow silicone voxels, where now when you add and remove air, you're obviously increasing and decreasing the volumes of individual voxels. As you can see in this, uh, this short video here, 